So I would see the biotech art camp as a continuation of the legacies of uh, what uh, the modernism or um, the avant-garde experiment were giving to us in, in various ways. And we could refer to the Bauhaus, for example. We could refer to Andy Warhol's factory. I'm dealing with uh, art for a very long time, having finished art history. And um, I have been curating for the past 20 years, mostly projects uh, that deal with uh, new media arts, and um, especially projects uh, that are concerning uh, biotech arts, uh, genetic arts. And I have edited the book Art in the Biotech Era, which is a... Uh, a very nice compilation of uh, artists, critics, and theories who deal with with the um, area of biotech arts and biotech culture, for that matter. What attracts me here is uh, seeing uh, these artists uh, who are working with biotech art practices and trying to place them in a broader uh, cultural and philosophic context uh, via the field, exploring the fields of. Um, biopolitics, biophilosophy, and biotechnology. Uh, in the history, we have had various um, moments when arts and sciences were linked, were very much uh, working together, and that was such a period was the Renaissance period, or the first decade of the 20th century, where we had parallelisms between arts and sciences. And um, people who have researched this matter, such as Arthur I. Miller, uh, find these parallelisms to be based on something we call visual thinking. So if we're able to think visually, uh, whether in arts or in sciences, then we're able to uh, come up with uh, significant discoveries. And that it is the, the task of both artists and scientists to uh, bridge this huge gap. So I believe that uh, biotech art is a uh, one stellar example where we're able to bridge the gap between the arts, between the humanities, and bef between the sciences. Uh, therefore, it's uh, very uh, interesting to see the works of biotech artists here in this camp and uh, how they are able to work together. So, in a way, it's a collective, um, it's a triumph of collectivity in a way. Uh, biotech arts is this special field uh, which enables us to mm, uh, grasp or enter another field, very significant, uh, which is called biopolitics. So basically, uh, the sociopolitical consequences of the biotechnological revolution uh, have a, a tremendous impact on civilization. Uh, governments, um, societies are very well, very well aware of that. And um, in a way, biotechnology is used very much for biopolitical purposes. Whether it is that uh, some of the artists use uh, uh, biotechnology in a sense to uh, assist the normalization of acceptance of bio technology within society, because as you might remember 25, 30 years ago, it wasn't that accepted. So just by the very fact that the artists are working with biotechnology, society gets used to this, but it normalizes the situation. So we cannot say that biotech artists are neutral in this respect. So therefore, I have, I have to say that uh, the work of avant-garde artists and experimental artists uh, is always one which signals um, elements of what is happening in society and what will happen in society. Contemporary society is able uh, to come up with different forms of uh, normalization of certain states. A society uh, can, uh, just by normalizing certain situations, uh, be able to control the situation much easier than it was able to control them by, uh, by punitive actions. So that is one of the, uh, one of the points of, of biopolitics. If you're able to program, basically, society from, the, um, from, uh, from a certain position and take it to where you want to, then you're able to uh, successfully fulfill the mission of biopolitics. Steve Kurtz would certainly be one of them, and, and the critical art ensemble, uh, in terms of uh, uh, critiquing uh, 
society. Uh, and the conflict, and, and there's always latent conflict between artists and scientists. Uh, there is this um, non-understanding of what the arts wants to to say and what the sciences want to say. Society as a, as a whole has not bridged uh, this divide between the arts and science, sciences and therefore we cannot move further and quicker in the 21st century. Uh, and I think both the arts and the sciences, uh, they have certain codexes uh, about ethics and uh, how you can work with living uh, organisms, with uh, living materials and uh, what is necessary uh, in order to do so. So I would say in the field of ethics that uh, the arts and sciences both co-constitute each other because they ask questions which uh, are used in the, for, uh, for the making of, uh, of certain biotech art projects. Uh, they both ask questions from their respective disciplines. So in a way they co-constitute co the question which is later on put to the uh, ethics authorities, whether at universities uh, or um, some other civil authorities. Now, in order to develop projects in, in biotechnology, uh, there are uh, different um, ways of how you can do it. Uh, you can either work with uh, tissue culture, which means you, you work with uh, cells as they are, um, or you can use uh, genetic materials. Now, if you use genetic materials, uh, you could use cancer, uh, you could use uh, animal materials, or you could use uh, human cells. Yeah, animal cells or human cells. So in a, in a way, there are various limitations from the conceptual level uh, to the practical level of working with uh, biotech art materials. Well, one of the limitations is that the material in a lab, that the material uh, from the uh, plants. Uh, and the uh, humans cannot be mixed. You cannot work with this material in the same laboratory. It has to be different laboratories. So this is one sort of an ethical, um, let's say, considera consideration or a certain decision that was taken at some point by universities and which is applied all around, yeah, all across the board. So if a certain uh, laboratory or a certain camp uh, is being attributed as if it, it will work only with uh, plant cells uh, or only with animal cells, it will be highly unlikely, impossible, that you could be working with human cells as well. So, um, yeah, that is one of, one of the limitations and one which artists also know, especially artists who work in laboratories. Yeah, the works of... Uh, let's say Adam Zaretsky and, 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 and other artists who work across the board uh, and uh, who uh, use uh, mater genetic materials or uh, tissue materials and uh, use them in a way which is uh, artistic or sort of more liberal. Sometimes they find uh, problems with the labs themselves uh, that are wanting to impose different uh, rules uh, and rightly that, that they want to control the process in, uh, in a way. Yeah, it would be interesting to see uh, that artists are, um, let's, say, let's say, how artists are able to bend these very strict rules. It's, uh, in a way, um, some artists do, but then again, it's, they either get into problems or uh, there is, uh, you know, problems further down the track. Ethics plays a, a great role in today's world, and uh, I, I believe it will be playing greater and greater role. So I think education is very important uh, from the beginning, and I think uh, understanding of of what it is that we want to do uh, in a certain situation and how we want to do do it. What sort of results do are we expecting, and uh, what sort of uh, let's say, unexpected uh, results we might come, come up with have to be conceptualized in a way that they're understandable to everyone. Uh, we discussed uh, the nature of Bath and how beautiful it was and uh, um, just the mountains and the lakes and the, and the, and the rivers and uh, he referred to it as a, a large, as a giant petri dish, which is quite interesting. 
the second law of thermodynamics says that uh, all closed uh, all closed systems must eventually implode. Uh, but uh, it is cultural memories that enable us uh, that we uh, surpass the situation and uh, that enable each generation to have more information than the previous one. So uh, I think that the situation of the camp is one that enables uh, cultural memories to be used at its best. What I would really like to see is a collective work coming from, uh, from a camp such as this, because all of the artists, they're working really on their own themes, themes which they really know very much and which they research, and they research in a way uh, that is very individual. But I believe that in the, in the collective work, there is some, always some surprise and uh, there is always something which, which comes along which no one really expected. And this new effect, this uh, sort of a, you know, a, a effect of like Bertolt Brecht's Fau effect uh, really um, is not only artistic, but, but really enables us to see the world in a different way. Yeah, and then creates another road, another path uh, for us. This new way of working uh, is, uh, I would say, uh, maybe also a way of how um, biopolitics is being um, um, sort of altered in, in a way, because do it your, the do-it-yourself technology and, and the DWO technology in a way enables a great variety of, of um, artists, um, even children, to work with technologies which were in, unimaginable even five or ten years ago. So even now you have biotech art kits, like biotech kits, which you can buy for $50 in pharmacies, and you can really work professionally or semi-professionally with them. So this is the, the liberating aspect, an aspect that prevents uh, biopolitics of fully dominating biotechnology, of... of um, uh, fully inserting itself over society. So, as I see biopolitics trying, or governments trying to control via the means of biotechnology uh, the population, I also see this liberating, revolutionizing aspect, which, uh, and, and, and one of the ways of how that is enabled is through these uh, do-it-yourself kits, which are being sold online or being sold in, uh, in, in pharmacies. So, uh, there is a potential for liberation, I would say. Uh, Marshall McLuhan said, we, we uh, shape our tools and then the, sh the tools shape us. Uh, the, the idea of phenomenology and why I'm talking about phenomenology is that uh, phenomenology and society co-constitute each other. That's, that's the predominant idea of, of uh, phenomenology, which means that it is a continued reciprocal uh, condition of what they are. So, like many of you would, would know Heidegger and his phenomenology, which is the, the critique, the, the ultimate critique of the technological attitude, where technology is not only an artifact, but it comes, uh, or it results from the previous technological attitude we've, we've had towards the world. According to Heidegger, uh, the framing is the essence of this technology, and he finds the root in techne. Uh, and many of you will know that techne is both the root, root word for art and, and for technology, so in a way, uh, it, it is what enables us to move through this. Now, another guy is, uh, who's important in, in terms of phenomenological research is Albert Borgman, who, who comes up with a free position. So, uh, he says that instead of the frame position of Heidegger, uh, that, society, that uh, modern technology uh, frames the world uh, for us in, uh, in a shape of, um, of apparatuses, of different apparatuses. Uh, the, but thereby hiding the full referent reality of, uh, of the world. So it means it disconnects us from the full reality of some things. And as you know, today we're all with our laptops, with our mobile phones, with all sorts of devices. So really, uh, the, uh, the world is presented to us in a device mood. And then maybe some of you know about Don Haidt, and where he, he speaks or, uh, about the uh, hidden uh, behind the technological front through this relationship of eye technology and world relations. Uh, Biotechnology uh, enables an economical hegemony. So it enables us uh, through uh, the research, but also through the products of biotechnology. Uh, and 
it's, we've had Chase Dunn, Tevinum, and, and uh, Brewer uh, show that different parallels can be seen uh, as they could with the world hegemony. So we have the Dutch uh, trading hegemony in the 17th century. Then we have the, the, the British uh, hegemony of the 18th and 19th century. And we have the American hegemony of the 20th century. So uh, somewhere by the end of the 20th century, the US government kind of figured out that maybe they're on the downfall. Uh, and they were looking into which technologies can be developed so that uh, uh, the uh, US will maybe achieve another century of dominance as the British did in the 18th and 19th century. And uh, the studies came up with the uh, concept that it's only possible to realize this via biotechnology. Nowadays, the situation has, uh, has turned around. And we even have city-states like Singapore uh, who are able, out of nothing, to, to create a lot of uh, biotechnological research, uh, China and such as well. And uh, we've uh, sort of come up to this uh, situation that uh, it, uh, biotechnology has become decentralized. Biotechnology maybe really shouldn't get into the hands of, uh, of ordinary people, that everyone shouldn't really be working with them. And so there should be a ban imposed, maybe uh, such as was the ban on plutonium. Uh, there is an, uh, a, work, a, a writing called New Biopolitics, and it's, called, and it's written by Zhang Jia uh, Yu and Zhang Wei Liu, and they, they have an essay called uh, New Biopolitics. And what they, what they claim is that uh, the um, uh, biotechnological revolution deeply changes uh, and uh, reconstructs Foucault's concept of biopolitics and announces the era of biocapitalism. One of them is utopian hope, and other, the other one is dystopian uh, de desperation. So biocapitalism not only is able to create an ethical degeneration and cultural shock, but even more important, opens up new areas of political hegemony and economical aggression through reconstruction of biopolitics, uh, as well as uh, through an overall domination of capital over nature and human society. I am thinking that, that it is possible uh, that uh, at some point uh, biocapitalism can turn into something which we would call biosociety, which would be uh, uh, in a humane way, uh, uh, programming society uh, so that it doesn't really um, um, get into these circular crises of capitalism as we always have. I really think that there is a biopolitical apparatus which is being created, and it's being created in various areas. Um, so, um, economy, commerce, all uh, assist with the creation of the biopolitical apparatus, but uh, art as well is not innocent in all of this. Uh, artists can be helping in the creation of the biopolitical apparatus uh, simply by taking a neutral stand. So, when, uh, so this neutral stand, in a way, you can argue that it creates positivism, which later on uh, normalizes uh, practices of biotechnology and conveys them to society in, as a fait accompli. So uh, uh, I, that's why the ethics is quite important. And, and uh, uh, it, it is important that, that artists always take into consideration uh, possibilities, uh, unwanted or wanted, or, or simply remain with a critical attitude. Uh, always throughout their life.